We now know that two deliveries of Starlink terminals have been made to Ukraine. And it got me thinking, I wanted to talk to someone who's kind of an expert in this area, just about what we're seeing, and also about the future of Starlink in general. Tim Farah founded a satellite communications consulting business in 2002. He has 30 years of experience. He's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal many times. And so I wanted to reach out to him personally. I've been doing this for 30 years nearly. And uh, so uh, remember the last time we had a big boom in satellite and a big crash at the end of the 90s. You know, first, I kind of wanted to get to the current news with Starlink being used in Ukraine. I mean, this is such a unique situation. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on, on that? Satellite communications has always been a big uh, thing for governments, defense forces, emergency situations. Uh, the DOD is the biggest customer for most satellite communications companies. And so it's hardly a surprise that in a conflict situation like this, uh, we'd see uh, satellite technology being used. And uh, you know, now Starlink is operational. Uh, you know, it's the latest and greatest technology. It offers uh, much faster speeds than most uh, previous generations of satellite technology. So uh, inevitably, people want to put it to use. So, I mean, looking back 20 years uh, or so, uh, you know, the first uh, use of uh, Iridium uh, for, for commercial purposes and for government purposes was in the, the Kosovo conflict in 1999. Uh, and it went on from there. And the DOD ultimately backed that system and rescued it uh, and kept it going. And, and it's been critical to their operations ever since. So uh, I think a lot of people are looking at Starlink as something that uh, uh, may serve the same purposes for the DOD going forward. It looks like they had a, applied for approval weeks before this conflict, but then they kind of got approval via a tweet to Elon Musk. So it, it, that's pretty unique that they got that OK from a tweet. Yes, it is. I mean, on the other hand, I, I don't think the uh, regulator in Ukraine is uh, spending a lot of time looking at telecom applications and satellite communications applications right now. They've got bigger things on their plate. That's how business is done nowadays and how Elon likes to, to handle things, uh, uh, tweeting out uh, pictures of people using equipment and uh, uh, co corresponding directly with uh, government officials on Twitter is, is something he's uh, made a habit of. We just saw the mobile roaming enabled. That's something that a lot of people here in the U.S. are desperate to have, you know, especially if they're RVers. Um, what do you think about them turning that on and how useful that is? Well, I mean, the thing you need if you're going to do mobile roaming and, and pick up your terminal and take it somewhere else is you need capacity in the beam where you start and you need capacity in the beam where you end up. And if you are freely able to take your terminal anywhere in the country, uh, they're going to have a much more difficult job managing capacity than they would uh, in a situation where you know where everyone is and you can say, OK, we can have 100 people in that place and we can have 100 people in that place uh, and they're not moving. So the US is incredibly capacity constrained as far as Starlink goes at the moment. And so it's not a regulatory issue uh, as much as simply there are you know, almost no terminals in Ukraine and almost no users in Ukraine. So if you pick it up and take it somewhere else, you're going to find an empty beam to use it. And it's as simple as that. You know, uh, you can allow roaming in a place where there's no users to date much easier than you can allow roaming in a place like the US where you already have 100,000 plus subscribers uh, trying to get their share of the capacity at home. I mean, the Russians have done a lot to uh, imply that some of these space technologies are a threat. Uh, they blew up a, an old satellite of theirs in orbit in last November. Uh, there was the story of uh, fiber lines going to Svalbard off Norway uh, being cut in January. That's a, a big hub for uh, satellite communications up there. A lot of the gateways for things like Iridium and for OneWeb and for Earth observation systems are located there. So... Uh, Clearly, the Russians are very sensitive to the potential of these new technologies in space. Uh, and I think it's certainly something we have to worry about going forward, that uh, uh, the Russians might take even more drastic action. Do you think that Starlink will democratize Internet in a way that we haven't seen before? Well, I think Starlink is, like any satellite communication system, has its limits. 
it's only going to serve at most a few million people. It's not something that can serve the majority of the world's population by any stretch of imagination or even the majority of, of any country's uh, needs for internet and, and, and communications generally. Um, if they get to serve a few million people, uh, then in, in say the US with a population of 300 million, uh, is that really going to change the way in which people behave generally? I don't think so. Uh, on the other hand, it can provide a lot of benefits to the last few percent who aren't connected. And it certainly may transform the way we use internet on ships or planes or in remote areas going forward. That's, that, that is a huge benefit uh, of these new systems. Um, and it's not to be underestimated, but it's not going to change the world in the sense of your everyday mobile phone or your home internet for most people uh, is not going to be any different in 10 years time from what it is today. Where do you think it will have the greatest application that will impact? You know, is it by air? Is it by sea? I think that it's most likely to have the, the greatest amount of revenue coming from uh, remote communications, people uh, uh, who live up in the mountains, people who live in remote areas. Uh, generally, those people who can afford to pay $99 a month are going to be in wealthier countries. Uh, the US today accounts for something like two thirds of all the world's satellite broadband subscribers. Uh, and, and that may well still be the case in five years time, even with Starlink uh, increasing the numbers of users. Uh, that may not change. So, so I would say U.S. consumers in remote areas may benefit reasonably significantly to the tune of at least hundreds of thousands and, and possibly ultimately a few million users. Um, and then we'll see it being important for defense forces. We'll see it being important potentially for planes. Uh, will we see this being something on cruise ships or you know, will we see other satellite communications technologies coming along that are more, uh, you know, specifically geared to those applications? I think I think Starlink's designed for a consumer broadband service, and of course, it's going to do more than just that. Um, but it's people who want something similar uh, to, you know, they can take advantage of those consumer communications. Other systems are designed around business needs that are designed around planes or they're designed around ships. Mm -hmm. uh, and those will, you know, have more advantage in those areas potentially. You've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal about your concerns with the future of Starlink and, you know, its success hinging on Starship. And I mean, has your outlook changed at all? I think it's very clear that, you know, with the current 2000 or so satellites, they don't have very much capacity. Elon said that they need Starship, they need a you know more advanced second generation satellites with more capacity on each satellite. Uh, at the moment, it looks like Starlink might only be able to serve a couple of hundred thousand people in the US, and that's not going to generate uh, billions of dollars needed to pay for this system. So they obviously need to scale it up to be a success. And then the question is, you know, can they get a million, two million, five million, ten million subscribers? that is gonna generate the billions of dollars a year to, to keep this system afloat, uh, let alone generate the cash flows that are claimed to be you know, gonna be devoted to going to Mars. So they've raised $5 billion over the last uh, three years, and at least half of that has likely gone towards uh, Starlink. So, you know, and they may spend billions more. You know, they're, they're accelerating launches, they're launching every couple of weeks this year. Uh, they could easily spend a uh, billion dollars plus on Starlink this year. Uh, and so, you know, at, at $99 a month, that means they need, uh, you know, at least 800,000 subscribers just to, you know, offset that billion dollars of, uh, of cost. That's going to require a lot more capacity. It's going to require a lot more customers. It's going to require a lot more satellites. So, so they're running to keep up in terms of adding capacity and adding satellites to, to meet uh, demand, you know, they've got a lot of deposits. If they can convert all those customers, then great, but they need a lot more satellites to do that. And so, you know, I think they're going to need at least several million subscribers before they can hope to get to a break even on a sustainable basis. Right. And I think their issue isn't so much demand, it's just, um, you know, getting the capacity, like you were saying. 
to make. That's it right. Happen. I mean, these satellites are flying all around the Earth. They're, you know, only about five percent of them are over the U.S. at any one time, and uh, and so you can't devote that much of your capacity to the U.S. If if all the subscribers were uniformly spread around the world, then everything would be great, and you'd be able to serve millions of people already. But because you know the vast majority of their deposits are currently in the U.S., uh, you know they're going to have to add a lot more satellites to to meet that demand. And that's the challenge that they face at the moment. It's costly, it's difficult, it's time consuming uh, to, to add all that uh, uh, capacity to serve the customers they hope to have where those customers actually want to use it. Some people say that they should make Starlink free in you know, third world countries. Do you agree with that? Well, I, we, we heard a lot about that a few years ago. We heard about Google and Facebook were going to bring uh, free internet to the developing world. Um, you know, ultimately, someone's going to pay for this system. And, uh, you know, maybe people would do things on a charitable basis. Uh, but we haven't seen things happening on that scale to date. I think there will be, you know, charitable uh, donations uh, to developing countries for particular purposes. I mean, certainly the case that these LEO systems, whether it's Starlink or other systems uh, like OneWeb, are going to be tools of sort of geopolitical power. I mean, even the Chinese, uh, I, I think, think about uh, their prospects of launching a satellite constellation in the same way. Uh, and so uh, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, overseas aid in the form of connectivity uh, could well be something that happens in the future. Um, but uh, you know, all of that hopefully then generates money that flows back to help pay for the system. And that's really where, you know, the rubber meets the road is like, is there going to be, uh, you know, an economic business here uh, that supports launching all these satellites and keep doing it to, uh, you know, to keep the service going? How will Starlink uh, not be a repeat of Iridium? I mean, Starlink has already got a lot more customers uh, signed up than Iridium did. At the, you know, Iridium basically uh, signed up about 20,000 customers in its first nine months of operation. Starlink has done a lot better than that so far. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, Iridium became a success because its satellites lasted for about 20 years before they got replaced. And that gave Iridium an awful long time to generate revenues to pay for the next generation of satellites. You know, Starlink satellites don't last very long. They've already had uh, several hundred of them be deorbited, uh, you know, because either they failed on orbit or because they, uh, you know, were used for testing purposes. And so, uh, you know, uh, and I think most people think that their satellites may only last four or five years. So, so that really puts the pressure on to ramp up really quickly uh, to to add customers and generate revenues more quickly. And that and that's you know critical. Is like, are we going to get to a million or two million customers in the next two, three, four years? Uh, and can Starlink continue to raise the money? I mean, it's been very easy for Elon to raise billions and billions of dollars in the last few years. Um, but if the stock market takes a turn for the worse and people uh, get more negative about future investment, will that money still be as easy to come by? I mean, a lot of other space companies are struggling. Uh, a lot of the companies that went public last year have had their share prices fall very substantially and uh, you know, doubts are increasing. So you know, Elon's been immune to that to date, uh, but will that continue indefinitely? Because he's certainly going to need billions of dollars to keep funding these efforts for the next few years. Can you give us any context into Elon's tweet recently that they they expected to have some delays in Starship and V2 uh, satellites due to the current focus in cybersecurity and signal jamming? There's a need to make sure that these uh, terminals and satellites are protected. And there's also, you know, big contracts that SpaceX has won to do things for the DoD. They won a $150 million contract about 18 months ago for early warning satellites. Uh, you know, we've not heard a lot about progress on that contract. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if the DOD isn't sort of uh, uh, calling them up and saying, well, so where's my satellites? So, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that they have to do for defense purposes and get on with. And, uh, you know, to some degree, this is perhaps a convenient excuse. Uh, they don't have a license for Boca Chica yet. Uh, you know, that's uh, any ruling from the FAA is not going to come through until the end of the month. And, and then even assuming that was favorable, they need a launch license. So, so in a way, it's a convenient way to push things back um, because they've got a lot of other things they need to focus on right now. And, uh, you know, yeah, I don't think it's the same people 
who are building rockets today are suddenly going to be writing code for uh, protection from jamming tomorrow. Uh, but you know, the company has a lot of things on its plate that it needs to get on with, and uh, and particularly, uh, uh, you know, building these uh, early warning satellites is something that's probably a high priority right now. Is there anything else about Starlink or Starship that I missed that you would like to add? Well, I think people underestimate the, you know, the number of different systems that are being built here. I mean, you know, we've got uh, SES with its O3B constellation. That's been pretty successful to date in serving, you know, cruise ships and, uh, and battleships. And, and they're just launching a bunch of new satellites with a lot more capacity. Uh, we've got OneWeb that's uh, backed by the British government that is, uh, uh, you know, been launching, a, uh, you know, uh, and has launched most of its constellation. We've got Telesat trying to develop a system. We've got the European Union uh, talking about developing its own system and, and the Chinese for that matter. So, you know, uh, and then we've got Amazon, which is the wild card here. I mean, Amazon, you know, has got even deeper pockets than SpaceX, uh, and uh, they've committed ten billion dollars. Uh, you know, we might see some sort of big splash from them this summer uh, if they're going to uh, announce that they're building a factory to make their satellites, and they've contracted for more launches, and 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 they're going to move forward aggressively. So. Um, I wouldn't underestimate the amount of competition that there's going to be out there. And, and Starlink has got a big lead. There's no doubt of that. Uh, um, but, you know, this is going to be a very competitive area going forward and uh, it's going to be a big issue geopolitically. When we got these big blocks of the US, we've got China, we've got the European Union, we've got the UK, uh, we've got Canada, all looking at backing uh, different systems, uh, uh, then, you know, it's going to make for a very interesting uh, you know geopolitical situation in space where where people have got their own system that they want to back they want to make it a success and uh, uh, and they're going to keep it going so uh, yeah a lot to look forward to a very exciting time so i really hope that you enjoyed that conversation if you like the video please make sure to like it and also subscribe to ellie in space if you're not already you don't want to miss any of the future content that i have coming up and a heads up i will be heading to austin the week of gigafest i'm going to TeslaCon. i'm gonna try to get into GigaFest. We'll see how that happens. Um, but I'm excited. I'm renting a Tesla for the event and it's going to be really festive and fun and probably a great opportunity to network with more YouTubers and meet more people in the Elon Musk universe. I've officially dubbed myself a musketeer. Um, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, I will see you soon.